Today in Alexandria, Virginia, in the peaceful library of his home, a man upon whom may depend the destinies of millions of workers in U.S. industry ponders his favorite classic. He is President John L. Lewis of the United Mine Workers of America. Around this one-time coal miner rages a momentous civil war in the ranks of organized labor. Victor of 30 years of bitter fighting in the cause of labor, Miner Lewis at 56 faces the greatest struggle of his career. Welded into a powerful and conservative oligarchy by Samuel Gompers in 1881, the Federation has remained strong, united, conservative. Since Gompers' death in 1924, President has been pious, peaceful William Green. Despite its power, the Federation's membership of three and one half millions represents only 10% of U.S. labor, for the most part skilled artisans, the aristocracy of labor, organized in small but powerful craft unions. Noteworthy exception in the Federation is the coal industry, for under John L. Lewis, the nation's half million coal miners are gathered not into small unions organized by crafts, but into one great industrial union comprising 95% of all coal workers. And under John L. Lewis, the United Mine Workers of America has become the world's greatest, richest labor union. Not in the Federation of Labor are the 30 million unskilled workers, the rank and file of labor in the nation's great mass production industries, oil, textile, rubber, steel. Again and again, Minor Lewis has proposed their organization. The American Federation of Labor must undertake to so revise its policy that it can welcome the admission of these millions of workers into the industrial form of organization for which they clamor. But other AF of L executives fear that the organization of mass workers might lead to radicalism. And the great part of the American Federation of Labor is sound. And as long as it remains sound, communism will never gain a hold in America. Unable to convert craft unionists to his way of thinking, Minor Lewis at last resigned from the vice presidency of the Federation of Labor, marched up and down the U.S. spreading the gospel of industrial unionism to organize the half million workers of the mighty steel industry, long an impenetrable stronghold of the open shop. He formed the Committee for Industrial Organization, backed by ten of the Federation of Labor's biggest unions. Into Pittsburgh, heart of steeldom, marched this tough two-fisted coal miner to launch an organization drive that would cost $75,000 a month. Gentlemen, this meeting has been called to secure definite financial commitments for the campaign to organize steel. The United Mine Workers of America have voted a quarter of a million dollars for this purpose. From the ladies' garment workers, the international oil workers, from unions comprising a million and a quarter memberships, Minor Lewis gets his pledges. Sergeant Hillman, may I ask you what the amalgamated clothing workers can do? You can count on $100,000 from the amalgamator. That makes a total of $550,000. The campaign will start at once. As the steel organization drive starts, the mighty steel industry prepares for what may be a momentous industrial crisis. Protecting their $5 billion investment are stout concrete walls, steel spikes, and barbed wire fences. And steel tycoons, resenting Minor Lewis's invasion of their industry, point to their wages and employment level, highest in years, and to the company unions, which they say give steel workers ample opportunity for collective bargaining. And as a final blistering challenge to John L. Lewis, Steel publishes a defiant full-page advertisement in 375 newspapers guaranteeing Steel employees the right to work without joining a union organized by outsiders. The arrogant automatum of a brutal dictatorship. If they want a showdown, they may have it. 
Organized labor accepts the challenge of the omnipresent overlords of steel to fight for the prize of economic freedom and industrial democracy. Denounced by Federation executives is Minor Lewis. We may compare John L. Lewis to Mussolini, the arrogant and unscrupulous dictator of whom it has been said that at times he suffers from a rush of blood to his head. Like a volcano, he spouts flame and burning lava. Finally, the Federation demands that the CIO be disbanded or take the consequences. But Mr. Lewis, the American Federation of Labor has threatened to suspend you. Won't they have to do something to save their face? Who says they have a face? Such action constitutes a challenge to the supremacy and authority of the American Federation of Labor and cannot and will not be tolerated. Suspended by the Federation are all ten unions in the CIO. More than one-third of the Federation's entire membership. You may say that I consider it an act of incredible and crass stupidity, an act dictated by personal selfishness and frantic fear. The American Federation of Labor can help if it will. It can oppose if it may. But we shall carry on. Today, with U.S. labor split in two, some there are who say that Minor Lewis is seeking power in steel because his grip on coal is slipping. But there are others who wonder if this one-time coal miner may not emerge as U.S. labor's man of destiny from the war which is to determine the fate of organized labor in the United States. Time marches on.